many of you believe that God wants to change you? How many of you would like to be changed by God? How many of you want to be changed? Say change. Say, I think a change is coming. How many of you believe a change is coming? Amen. How many of you remember that old song? Uh, a change is coming. A change is coming. Let's, let's go back here for just a moment here. I got a video here. I'm going to ask that text would just put on very quickly. Take us back home for just a moment. How many of y'all remember that? Can you say it with me? We got to do the offering at this time. Amen. The offering. The offering. Ushers. You know that I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. Say, neighbor, the Lord done changed my name. The angels in the heaven done signed my name. Let me ask you a question as you go to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Let me ask you a question. 
once your name has been signed by God and the angels have signed your name in the book of life, how does God change us after that? There is this issue of transformation, say transformation. And that God is constantly trying to transform us. He is trying to do, as that old song in the, that used to talk about uh, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and, 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 and all of those kinds of things. How does God transform us? Say transform us. The truth of the matter is there is none of us who are perfect. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's something wrong with all of us. In fact, when we come into this world, we come into this world with a particular kind of a problem. Nobody is perfect. There is this thing called sin that's, that standeth at the door of all of our lives. And so the question becomes, once you are born again, how then does God change us? Say, change us. He changes us by, first of all, making us realize that, first of all, he loves you. Say, God loves you. Turn to your neighbor behind you and say, neighbor, God loves you. Yes, God loves all of us. God loves you. I know for some people that's hard to believe when you look at your life and the things that you have done and the things that you are doing. It's hard for you to believe that God really loves you. But the truth of the matter is God loves you. There's some folk in the back who don't believe that God loves you. But you need to understand that when that not only that God loves you, but when God loves you, he loves you so much that he refuses to allow you to stay where you are. That what God ultimately wants to do is mature you and grow you. Say mature you and grow you. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. And so he won't allow you to stay where you are. God wants to change you and he wants to change you. He wants to shift you. As the song said, hold on, my brother, a change is coming. So the question becomes, what does he do in order to change you? How does he help us to grow? What is his ultimate aim? We know that his ultimate aim is that he wants to help you to become more like Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, he wants you to become more like Jesus. Yes, he wants you to become more spiritual. Say spiritual. But he's not only concerned about your spirituality, he's also concerned about your physical growth. Say physical growth. In other words, when you're going through physical illnesses, there are some people who say or ask the question, does God still care about me even in my health issues? The answer is yes, God cares about your health because he cares about your growth and your physical being. He also cares about how you are evolving emotionally say evolving emotionally I wish I had somebody praying with me today he, he does not want you to be afraid all the time you know there's some folk right now they're just afraid about everything and the Bible said that God has not given us the spirit of fear but he has given us the spirit of love and of a sound mind say sound mind so he does not want us to get all erratic about what is going on in our world today. In fact, Christians ought to be the most cool, calmest of everybody. Nothing ought to move them because they understand that there is somebody who sits high and looks low and guides our feet wherever we go. Have I got a witness in the house? And, and so God is concerned about your spirituality, your physicality. He's concerned about your social life, your emotional life. He's even concerned about your finances. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't get quiet on me now. I need God to be concerned about my finances. Turn to your neighbor behind you, look him in the eye and say, neighbor, hasn't there been times when you needed God to be extra concerned about your finances, especially when you didn't have two quarters to rub together? Is there anybody in the house who would be honest with me and tell me that there's been time in their life when they needed God to give them that, that which, which we call a breakthrough? Say a breakthrough. Yes, we've all needed breakthroughs. Last week, you know, there was a brother who came up to me and he just started crying on Wednesday night. And he was just crying. And I said, what's wrong with you? He said, you know, I had a breakthrough last week. I said, what happened? He said, well, you know, I've been off my job for three years. I said, three years? He said, yes, three 
years I've been off my job and I haven't been able to tithe because nothing was coming in. He said, but I wanted to tithe to God anyway. And so what I did was over the last several weeks, months or whatever else, I started just giving God a hundred dollars a Sunday off of what I was trying to live on, what I had before. I didn't have anything coming in. A hundred dollars. He started crying. I said, well, what are you crying about? He said, well, last week, you know, I didn't know I had some stocks and the stocks went up to about 29 whatever dollars or whatever. He said, they called me and told me about it and they sent me a check for $200,000. Can you give God some praise in the house? Can you give God some praise in the house? Don't tell me that God won't make a way out of no way. Don't tell me that God is not concerned about your finances. He loves us. He's concerned about us. And he wants us to grow. So the question becomes, how does he work this thing out? How does he work this thing out? How do you grow? Say, how do I grow? God loves me and he wants me to grow. So the question becomes, how do I grow? Do I just grow by osmosis instantaneously? It just instantly happens? Do I just walk out on the street and one day something hits me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and it just happened? The answer is no. It does not work that way. Here is what 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, the 18th verse says. If you, if, if you he'll put it up there on the, on the screen. It says, as God's spirit works within us. Say, as God's spirit works within us, we are being transform as God's work as God's spirit works within us we are being what to what the ultimate aim that God wants for you is to become like who to become like Christ and what what does the word being transformed mean it means that we are we are being transformed. We are in a process, and the process of being transformed, I wish I had time to preach this thing, is continuous or incremental. Say incremental. It's not an instant process of growth, but it takes time. And the text further says, to become more like Christ, this change from one degree to, an, to, to one degree to glory to another comes from the Lord. And the chapter that we wanted you to look at and, and think about was Ephesians 4. So the question becomes, how does, I know you don't need it today, but you might need it tomorrow. How does God grow me up? How does God grow me up? I mean, the truth of the matter is there's a lot of folk who are milk feeder and not meat eaters. The Corinthian passage talks about milk feeders and meat eaters. And, and, and Paul says there's too many of us who are milk feeders and not meat eater. We can't digest some very deep truths of God, but God ultimately wants us to grow. Say grow. And, and what he sends us is he sends us the same thing that he sends the Atlanta Falcon who is going to win today. Yes, the New England Patriots are not going to make it because the difference is, is that one has a good coach and the other one has a bad coach. And I'm sure that the Atlanta Falcon has better coaches than these other folk from up north. Y'all know who's gonna win, don't you? Just raise your hand, high five, and we'll agree to this thing called the Falcons has already got it in Atlanta. He grows us, and I think I'll just stop here and pick it up later. He grows us through coaching. He sends coaches our way. I, I, wish I, I wish I could really hammer this thing down in two minutes. Coaching. Coaching. Say coaching. Yes. And so the Ephesians 4 chapter is actually uh, that, that, that book, that, that chapter that gives us the elements of how God changes us and moves us from one place to another place. Uh, and so he says coaching. Y'all been praying for me? The Bible tells us that there's five kinds of coaches. Say five kinds of coaches. That's given to the church in Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 13. Verse 11 through 13, the Bible says, Christ gifted some of us to be apostles. Say apostles. 
Jesus. Now, now listen to me. You have to watch this kind of a coach because these kinds of coach are not the kind of coach that was given to us in Old Testament time. An apostle was a missionary. Say missionary. Paul was a missionary. He had went on missionary journeys, and so therefore he was one of the apostles. Then the Bible says he gives us prophets, say prophets, evangelists, say evangelists, pastors, say pastors, and teachers, so that his people would learn to serve and his body would grow strong. This will continue until we are united by our faith and understanding of the Son of God, that we will be mature. In other words, to be able to teach others. So he wants to grow us up by using coaches, and then he wants us to become a coach so that we can become like Christ, completely like him. That's what transformation is. And so what we need is a coach, say a coach. I wish I had time, Billy. I can't get it right. A coach. We need coach. The reason why we don't move forward, the reason why we don't grow sometimes is because we don't have a coach. Say a coach. And a coach, a coach. Oh, oh yeah, let me write this down. A coach does one or two things or either both of these two things. A coach maximizes our strength and minimizes our weaknesses. I wish I had some football players in the house maximizes our strength so what is it that God is trying to do constantly he's trying to maximize our strength and sometimes he has to maximize our strength through trials and tribulations sometimes he has to maximize our strength through blessings and other times he has to send this thing and that thing our way he's trying to maximize us because he's trying to grow us and all of us have some strength I wish I had a witness in the house all of us have some strengths in our life there's something strong about every one of us and so what God is trying to do is he's trying to strengthen us when we look at what's happening in America today I stop by to tell you that God is trying to strengthen America sometime he has to strengthen us through strange presidents have I got a witness in the house sometimes he has to strengthen us through threat through threats and all kinds of intimidation sometimes he has to send sinners folk like Trump maximize our strength just turn to your neighbor and just say neighbor God is trying to grow you up through trials and tribulations if I didn't have a problem I would know that God could solve them but through it all I've learned to lean and depend on Jesus he's the coach say he's the coach You've got to have the coach in your life because at the end of the day, he's going to maximize the greatness of who you are. And he's going to minimize your weakness, which means that sometimes the coach has to get rid of some things in your life, weaknesses, so he can maximize your strength. Can I tell you a secret? One way that he does it is that he sends pastors if you're not in church if you don't have a pastor then you don't have a coach and I love to be your coach on Sunday mornings I'm trying to coach you through trials and tribulations I'm trying to take you up a higher level I'm trying to help you to climb Jacob's ladder so that the, the rounds will go higher and higher and sometimes God coaches us through the church. You need the church. There's somebody in here. You've left the church. You're out of church. You're running around from church to church. Here is what Paul says in that great Ephesian pas passage. He says sometimes he sends us pastors and teachers. What you need sometimes to be strengthened in life is just a coach. That's all I am. I'm a coach. But not only does he send us coaches to help us change, shift, and become transformed, he also wants you to become a coach to somebody else. Stand on your feet for a moment and just give God a great big hand praise. Stand on your feet and give God a great big hand praise. 
Come on, come on. The question is, who are you coaching? Just bow your heads in a word of thanks unto God. Who are you coaching? Who are you coaching? Who are you coaching? Who is your coach? Who coaches you through challenging moments in your life? Who helps you to survive when things look as if they're not survivable? Who coaches you when you hear bad news, when you get news from the doctor that things are not well? Who coaches you through that? Who coaches you when you don't have the finances to provide for your family? Who coaches you? As in the case of that brother who came to me on last Wednesday. Who coaches you when you can't get employment year after year? Who coaches you when you go to the doctor and suddenly you have an incurable disease? Let me tell you, Super Bowl is about good coaching. And again, the reason why the Atlanta Falcon is going to win is because they've got good coaching. You need a good coach on your side. You say, well, Reverend, I've got the coach on my side. The question becomes, are you hearing and listening to the coach? Last week when I was doing interviews with TV stations about the young girl who was missing, they basically asked me, Reverend, why do you think this prayer time with this family is going to work? And I basically told them, it is because we have gone to Jesus time and time again. And no matter how dark and dreary it gets for people, we have discovered that the Lord will somehow make a way out of nowhere. Good coaching. Day or two later, they found the culprit or the alleged killer of that little girl. Can you give God some praise? Listen to me, my friend. Once you are in Christ, you need to be in church. You need to be coached every Sunday. I, I say it time and time again. I don't know how people can get by week to week without going to church, worshiping the Lord, praising Him, and hearing a word from Him. I don't understand how that happens. I don't understand how fathers can be good fathers without good coach, coaching from God through the church, through the pastor. I don't understand how relationships work when those folk are not in Christ and in the church being led by a pastor. Some folk have said to me, say, Reverend, I don't need a man on earth to lead me anywhere. And I point them to the Ephesians fourth chapter where it says that God has gifted you with these persons, that they might lead you and guide you into the transformation of becoming more like Christ. If there's any other prayer we need to pray, it is that we all will become more like Jesus. If you're here today, you've never accepted the ultimate coach in your life, you need to do it right now. You need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to believe that the coach came down here first and sacrificed his life for you. Could you all pray for the unsaved right now? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, saints. Your neighborhood and our neighborhood would be different. Our world would be different. Shifts would occur once everybody becomes in Christ. Would you pray for those who are here today who are struggling and trying to figure out their way to God? Would you pray for the unchurched right now? Would you pray for the de church? These are people who have been in church, but they've left the church. And perhaps right now they have come here to the Mount Zion family. Could you pray for them as well? This is no time to play. These are very, very serious times. 
I wrote in one of my posts last week that America seems to be talking about greatness and peace while preparing for war. America seems to be talking greatness and peace while preparing for war. I don't want to frighten anybody. But I tell you something, that if I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No president, no threats, no intimidations, no bullying. But I am convinced that no weapon formed against me because I'm being coached through this thing. You might come here afraid, but I'm being coached. The weeping man do it for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I'm being coached that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I'm being coached that the Lord will never leave me nor forsake me. I'm being coached. And so now I'm trying to coach y'all to help y'all believe that. Would you repeat after me? Say, dear God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you, God, for making me to know that when I accept you in my heart, my life, my soul, my condition, my world then I, I shall be all right and saved because of what you did for me on Calvary once you pray that prayer you're saved but there may be somebody in the house today God is leading me to open an open invitation if you're here today as every head is bowed choir heads bowed no one's looking up and trying to see who is going to lift their hand today if you're here today and you don't have a church home and you'll be honest with me you'll just lift your hand up and say Reverend I'll be honest with you I don't have a church I'm looking for a church I don't even go to church that much if you're in one of those three categories lift your hand up